much stuff out before the weekend um and uh mr harrington here has taken a week vacation so we're trying to get everything under control at the shop so i can uh manage the helm myself for a week here sounds like you guys are pretty busy there and jake's going on a little vacation huh so no transformers is for the vacation huh (laughs) uh yeah sadly i well actually i told my girlfriend no, we're 100% bringing some figures. <laughs> She's like, hey, we're going to have a nice beach weekend. And it's going to be so nice. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to bring Transformers. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> this is just the thing that we're going to have to accept. There's like a baby seat behind the car. And it's just like a little Optimus Prime, like buckled in. <laughs> <laughs> Are you guys safe? Are you going to be okay? <laughs> <laughs> Optimus Prime wants a juice box. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jake, um, Jake I got a couple Mark questions Mark. for you guys, man. So, uh, yeah, so Ben and Jake, uh, why don't you guys tell the the audience here a little bit about yourselves? Um, you know, like where you guys come from and all that good stuff. So, I don't know if Ben or J- Ben or you want to go first, or if Jake, you want to go first and just tell the, the audience a little bit about yourself. I guess I'm going first. Um, I was born and raised in the middle of nowhere, northern Wisconsin. Um, my dad was a car guy. Uh, both of my parents were big uh, antique collectors. Um, and whenever we'd go out of town shopping, my dad would usually get me some, you know, kind of toy cars or something like that. Um, and one time, sometime around the age of two or three years old, um, he got me a toy car on a trip out of town, uh, but the toy car turned into a robot. And uh, the rest is kind of history, and now I have thousands of plastic robots just (laughs) packed everywhere in my life. Um, And uh, after uh, different careers post-college graduation, um, Matt, the uh, owner and and uh, starter of transformerland.com who was a friend of mine and i helped him out with uh, information on the website about transformers toys um looked me up and said hey i've been doing just gangbusters business i cannot manage all of it myself anymore do you want to come work for me full time and at the time i was working in the paper chemical industry and uh, traveling way more than i had agreed to on the contract and so I said, sure, let's do it. And we moved down here to Gainesville, Florida uh, in 2013, November. And I've been doing uh, toys full time since then. Wow. You know, you brought up a good thing, Ben. Uh, you mentioned how when you were a small kid, your dad gave you a little toy car that transformed and the rest was history because... I kind of have a little story like that where I was never a toy collector until like 2004 where one of my bosses came with a tote filled with action figures and inside that tote was all Street Fighter figures and my coworker that at the time, he was an action figure collector and he's like, oh my God, Blanca, Vega, Ryu, so he's going crazy and I'm just like, uh, I don't want anything and he's like, dude, you don't want Street Fighter figures, they're free. So, you know, I took like a Vega 
a Chung Lee, just two figures. And then my coworker looked at me, he goes, ooh, you're going down a treacherous pass right now. And I'm like, what? What are you saying? But he's like, you're going to become an addict. I'm like, no, I'm not. And then cut to six months later, I have a freaking wall filled with action figures. So I totally understand how, how that is. So, um, but Jake, now what about see, yourself? Oh, oh I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Your uh, your mistake was getting a third figure because three is a collection, you see. <laughs> so if there's like a series of Transformers where I'm not sure if I want to jump in and get every last one of them, I make sure that I never buy more than two because once it's three, then it's a collection and now you got to get them all. So that, that was your big mistake. Not the first two, the third one. That was that was the gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> That's the rabbit hole already. <laughs> I got to get them all. <laughs> uh, Jake, what about yourself, man? Uh, I was born and raised in Florida. And just all my life, I've kind of had just an abundance of wanting just robots that turn into vehicles throughout my entire life. The, the first real thing that I can actually remember was my dad got me Robots in Disguise 2001 sky bite and he turns into like a shark and i was just so enthralled by that i was just immediately like okay i have to have all of them and just throughout the years it was just all transformers and um when the movies came out in 2007 i was just blown away by how everything looked i literally thought that they were real i thought that that was actually optimus prime on screen and i was like yes that's exactly how he would look because he's real <laughs> <laughs> and like all the transformers because they turn into real cars and everything and i was just blown by that back by that um but as like time went on and i went and got into a teenager i was like i don't really care about giant robots as much anymore i want uh, a girlfriend and play video games bah. and then and like yeah exactly <laughs> so <laughs> like that I was 15 and then I stopped collecting and playing with figures and then I was 18 and I was like, all right, I want more toys in my life because this shit is boring <laughs> to not play with anything. <laughs> Video games aren't doing it for me anymore. I need something more exciting in my life. So I started coll collecting uh, Age of Extinction and then so on and so forth. And then I had a bunch of generations figures at the time as well i said this just isn't doing it for me these figures i've put too much money into this and i don't feel the satisfaction i think i want to go in the direction of masterpiece so i went over to transformer land and sold my entire collection to matt got a couple masterpieces sold another collection and the second time um, i did that i matt was telling me that Ben was going to be there instead. And I went over there to pick something up. And then that's how he and I met. And we just hit it off immediately. And I was like, all right, awesome. I think I, I think I found my entire calling of just being like, okay, yeah, no, giant robots to turn to shit is going to be my thing forever. <laughs> and um, <laughs> after that, it was like a couple of years down the road. I was like, okay, uh, I want a different job. And they were like, well, we have a great position for you. And I was like, all right, awesome, cool. So that's kind of how that whole thing started for me. You got sucked in. It's definitely great. I love having all the Transformers. Yeah, I have all the options. It's like, do I want this? Do I want to collect this? I'm just going to play with it. Wow, that sucked. I don't want that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you this, man. Since you guys are Transformers collectors, like at the store, um, do you guys get dibs on like, you know, certain figures or anything like that? Uh, I I have my little um, pile that things get diverted to, and I we get one of the, the few figures that I don't already have. Yeah, we both of us have our respective gank piles, where we're just like, yeah, I want that. I'll take that for now, and then just kind of disappear into the background <laughs> for the time being. And then maybe a few months or more later, it's like, okay, yeah, no, hey, Matt. That uh, Transformer, that's just popped up out of nowhere. How much you want for it? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a flag on top of that pile? That must be a big pile. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Jake's, pile is, Jake's pile is honestly bigger than mine, but I'm picky. I'm, I'm jaded and picky about stuff. 
Yeah, mine's just giant boxes. It's like uh, fans' toys, quietest. Um, Generations Metroplex, uh, Botcon RC. I'm like, yes, I want all of it. I want all the Beast Wars <laughs> stuff. <laughs> And that must be treated, you know, I think that's pretty tough being a collector of Transformers and also working at a place where you sell Transformers and you're just seeing Transformers every day. It's like, I want that one. I want this one. I want that masterpiece, man. Oh, my God. That would be that. That would be insane. I, I know I would have a hard time with that. So that's all. Awesome. It is definitely an exercise in restraint some days, especially with the way some prices have gone lately. Um, like we both. We're both big fans of Beast Wars, and there was a BotCon exclusive box set um, themed around Beast Wars from 2006. And, uh, you know, we, we both were kind of lusting after it. Um, and the price of that set was just such that, you know, another friend of, of all of ours at the shop was like, this is one of the last BotCon box sets I need. And he was okay with, you know, the, the absurd prices these things are going for nowadays. And it's like, all right, got to let it go because I'm, I'm not ready to pony up that kind of cash on that set. So, you know, it is, it is an exercise in restraint. Um, I could definitely spend uh, all the inheritance that I'll never get, <laughs> you know, in, in one sitting. It just on, you know, there's, there's a few categories within transformers that are so expensive that you know one figure will cost you as much as a complete collection of something else um and so i guess my my tactic is i i feel the most gratification by collecting a lot of you know less less expensive figures um you know and getting a set of something maybe more modern as opposed to one original, you know, Japanese exclusive uh, Black Shadow from 1989, where it's like three thousand dollars just to get a nice one. You know, it's like three thousand dollars goes a long way on newer stuff, and I so I get more enjoyment out of doing it that way. Wow, well, three thousand dollars! Oh my God, has anybody? Have you guys ever experienced somebody walking into the store or ordering something like that amount? that that price amount and actually buying it oh yeah um the most i think the most expensive single item that we've sold uh was a sealed in you know factory tape seal g1 optimus prime in the original um what store was it they bought it from sears bag like the plastic bag with the purchase receipt Wow. Somebody had bought it for a Christmas gift, put the, the toy and the receipt in this bag, put it in the closet, and then forgot to ever give it to anybody for 35 years. And so this thing was brand new, 35-year-old toy. And I think that went for something close to $5,000. Um, I mean, prices, prices above 1000 are increasingly common in transformers collecting like for a single figure single figure single set wow wow man i feel bad for that person that was supposed to get that gift <laughs> somebody well, else got it and it was worth five thousand <laughs> yeah i mean the the person who would have got the gift would have probably made that five thousand dollar figure worth about 150 instead so oh that's arc true Argument can be made that uh, they they sacrificed it for posterity. <laughs> so let me ask you guys this: um, What is the day to day operation there, like in Transformer Land? Like, can you guys give us? Can you give like the audience like like a day to day like like work 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 day there, like at Transformers.com? Like, what do you guys do? That's that's a lot of inside baseball. Um, <laughs> <laughs> We, uh, the first thing every morning is, is packing orders. Um, we ship everything basically uh, the, the day after it's ordered, like next day shipping. Um, basically anything that's paid for by 11 o'clock goes out that day, like 11 a.m. Um, so that's always priority number one, is making sure people like, can get their fix in a timely fashion. Um, and then we have a weekly cycle of inventory updates. Um, every week we do 
you know, usually two, three hundred new items, sometimes more. Um, and so Jake will do the photographs, the, the product photographs of the actual items that people are going to buy. Um, and then I go through them and inspect them for defects and, you know, write the, the descriptions for the website. And um, that cycle kind of comes to head on Wednesdays when we post. And then other than that, it's kind of fill in with whatever needs to get done. Um, obviously, we're always buying toy collections. You know, that's absolutely every bit as important as uh, selling things, is buying things to sell. So, you know, we get most days of the week we'll have something come in from somebody else that, you know, either it's somebody's mom found a bunch of toys in her attic that her kids don't want anymore and they say, you know, do whatever with it, get rid of it. Uh, sometimes it's collectors, you know, longtime collectors who are like, I'm bored with these guys or I want some money to buy something else or, you know, maybe I'm deciding that, you know, I'm going to have kids and move to a different phase of my life. So I need to clear some space out. You know, I, I know there's been a lot of cases where it's like I have an entire room full of toys and that needs to become a room full of a baby. And so the toys got to go. Um, so most days of the week we'll get a box in. And we try and get those, you know, cracked open, inspect everything, get payment out as soon as possible. Um, you know, basically the the immediate tasks are always, you know, we have customers that buy from us and we have customers that sell to us. And that stuff's always first thing in the day. And then, uh, you know, taking the photos, inspecting the items, um, and, you know, just trying to organize everything is most of the rest of the, the work week. And uh, it's been crazy lately. You know, everybody's staying home. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of people shopping online. There's a lot of people, you know, looking for some money, extra money, selling stuff off. So we've been very, very busy with that. Yeah, you know, and, and I've ordered um, from you guys. Uh, I I ordered a mask uh, set, uh, Series 1. I think there was like 10 vehicles that I ordered. And I was very surprised of how fast it came because it came in like three days. And it was nicely packaged. Everything came in its own like Ziploc bag. And it was numbered. So, yeah, you guys are very efficient in what you guys do over there. So, I mean, I'm a customer myself. And I, I was very happy, especially getting that in like three days and the way the box was handled. So, it, it was amazing. And Jake, so Ben said that you take the pictures uh, for the figures. So as you're taking the pictures for the figures, are you like, come on, man, show me that little the little rear right there. Oh, yeah, the little tire right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, every day. I mean, I'll, I'll pop them out of the bag when I'm taking pictures of them, and I'll just, like, start playing with them. It's just like, oh, yeah, I, I need to replay with this real quick or look at that real quick. It's, oh, yeah, that's, that's a good that's thing. And other times I'm like, this is trash. Someone please buy it. <laughs> there's there's no accounting for taste. You know, there's there's stuff that it, there's a there's a buyer for everything. And we don't always have to agree with them about, you know, wanting that thing. Yeah. Like one of the big lines that me and Ben agree on a lot is Energon, where we're like, this is a very, very awkward like preteen just getting into their feelings kind of transfer line where everything's chunky, everything's kind of ugly, everything's just weird and disgusting colors. But hey, people eat it up and just are like, do you have a hot shot? Of course I want the hot shot. It's the worst hot shot ever, but of course I want it. <laughs> and they'll just they'll just tear through it. So I mean the 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 flip side to that is lines like that are cheap so you know if you want to you know bulk up a collection with some cheap fun you know i know a lot of people um you know guys closer to our age you know 30s they got young kids they'll do something like that that they can you know the kids can still play with because that stuff's not going to break and if it does it's like oh well it was 15 bucks you know yeah. we can just go get another one you don't want to hand your kid your 450 and fifty dollar uh masterpiece 44 optimus prime so <laughs> yeah you know what's funny is that i have a niece and my niece now she's 16 but when she was 10 years old she'll come into my room and she's looking at all the toys you know as a little kid you don't know that 
you know, these things are like expensive. So she's walking in, grabbing all my Ninja Turtles. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not for playing. That's, that's, uh, Michelangelo, the basketball player. It's a 1988 rare figure. <laughs> <laughs> but Uncle oh, Steve. So you, you actually fell into buying all those random costume turtles where it's like, oh, it's, it's, uh, Punk rock and Michelangelo. It's uh, <laughs> Army Boot Camp Donatello. <laughs> We're talking smack on those things, and now you own them. <laughs> yeah, I have yeah. a few. I have a. Uh, I have a uh, heroin addicted Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> I I got a question for you, Steve. Yeah. Do you own any toys that you don't like, but you felt you had to buy them? Like, I hate oh, this thing. This mm-hmm. sucks. Why did I buy this? Oh, well, it's got to go on my shelf. Or, oh, I needed this for a set, so I had to buy it anyway, because otherwise my set wouldn't have been complete, even though I don't want this thing. Oh, my God. That is such a good question for me. So when I got back, when I got into toy collecting, I was collecting everything and anything that was a toy. I had no purpose. It was just like, okay, this is uh, a, a popple. I'm going to buy this popple. Okay, uh, here's a McDonald's hamburger. I'm going to buy this. So I had no direction of what I wanted to collect. I was just collecting everything. And it's funny that you say that now, but now that I know that I'm more into, like, finishing lines like Voltron, uh, some Transformers, some real Ghostbusters, some Ninja Turtles, um, some masks. Like, now that I have a direction, the other day... I'm looking at all this other stuff that I'm like, why did I buy this? Like I had a a James Dean action figure. I'm like, why do I own a James Dean action figure? <laughs> like, why do I have this in my collection? This, this this means nothing to me. Then I'm looking around and I had a um, what was it? It was like a little Barbie that came from a McDonald's thing, and it was just like all this random stuff that. I just didn't even want or need, so like I literally just made a box so that I can give away of all this random toys. So, but yeah, I've I've been down that rabbit hole of things that I bought that I didn't even want. So, what about a figure where you didn't want it when you were in the process of buying it? Like you're like, no, somebody gave me this James Dean action figure. I don't want it, but I'll take it. Fine. But I'm talking about like. I really don't want this thing. I think it sucks. Here's a hundred dollars. Here you go. <laughs> have you ever have you ever had yes. that experience? Okay, okay, yes, yes, I have. So I've had that experience with the um what was it? The uh the Diamond Select Ghostbusters that have been coming out. So like lately, like Ghostbusters, like you have Diamond Select making them, you've had Mattel making them, uh, you've had Hasbro making them. And the thing that's funny is that each Ray character is the same looking Ray from each one. So I ended up having 10 Ray characters, Ray Stan characters, and they all pretty much look the same. And it's funny, I went one time and I found a Diamond Select Ray and he was slime, but I already have one slime from Mattel from another line. And I'm like, okay, this Ray is only 20 bucks. Should I buy this Ray? But it's only 20 bucks it's not 40 bucks oh i must buy it and i ended up buying another ray a, a ray that i didn't even need because i already have like seven rays and they all look the same and yeah so i ended up buying another ray and the funny thing about it is that i ended up giving it away there was no point of me buying it so yeah well, I'm, I'm glad to know that we're not the only ones that have had this experience. Yep. <laughs> a lot of people like to talk about how much they love certain toys, but uh, Jake and I spend a lot of our time talking about how much we hate certain toys that we bought with our hard-earned money. <laughs> like, yeah, like, like our, our my recent example was um, <clears throat> the Borker Cybertron trilogy, Chromia. It's just like, oh, did yeah, I really see. just set, spend? Twenty dollars, <laughs> three times on this worthless garbage mold. Three times, and it's like, yes, I did. I have all three versions, and I'm not happy about it. <laughs> but I had to do it because it was part of the set. It's like, yeah, I had to get the one from Siege. I had to get the Generation Selects Nightbird repaint, which is just the same fucking thing but black. <laughs> and then I had to get, um, uh, I had to go get the Netflix series one, which is just Chromia with some shit on her. 
<laughs> she looks like she just rode through a Florida mud puddle. And it's like, yes, this is exactly, yep, I just spent another $20. And it's just, <laughs> I'm not happy, man. <laughs> but I did it. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? They're doing that with Turtles right now. Like, they just released, uh, uh, it was a GameStop exclusive. It was the original four Playmate Turtles. Um, and they came out. Uh, in a package, and it was, I think it was like 45 bucks to get all four original Playmate Turtles. But the funny thing about that is that that same package, every year, they reissue the same original Turtles. They don't look the same. Uh, they all look the same. It, 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 there's nothing different about it. So, like, I found myself buying it, and I'm like, why am I buying this when I already have these Turtles? And it's one of those things where it's like, oh, Okay, it's Soundwave, but it's a Walmart exclusive. Oh, it's Soundwave, but it's the Soundwave from Netflix. It's Soundwave, but it's the Soundwave from the movie. And then you find yourself with, like, a room full of Soundwaves, you know? And it's, like, one of those collector mentalities where it's, like, okay, this is a different version, but not really. The box just says a Netflix exclusive or a Walmart exclusive. And then you find yourself buying the same thing over and over again. Well, where you really go crazy with somebody like Soundwave, where it's a popular character, Soundwave is one of the staples. That's one of the ones that everybody and their mom remembers. Hey, guy. And so what's what's really kills you is like, okay, you get the Walmart Soundwave. Well, that's a reissue of the G1. It turns into the, you know, the micro cassette player. And then you get the Siege one. Well, that one turns into a spaceship thing, I guess. And, you know, he's got a different aesthetic. They got him decorated with the little Cybertronian Greeblies or whatever. Um, and he's got, like, the standard 5 millimeter port, so you can combine them with the other weapons and stuff from that line. And then maybe you go out and get, like, the, the Robots in Disguise sound wave where he turns into an off-road truck. But what, what really gets you is when you're like, okay, I have the Walmart reissue of Soundwave, the G1 toy. Obviously, I got the G1 toy because you've got to have the original you know, the OG sound wave, um, preferably with an unbroken tape door. And then you got the uh, reissue from um, San Diego Comic-Con 2007 or so. They reissued the G1 sound wave with, you know, different stampings. Uh, his blue plastic is a little bluer or whatever. And he came with the cassettes. But then you also went and got the Toys R Us commemorative edition sound wave from 2006 where that one's, you know, he's got a slightly different tint to his tape door. It's, a, it's all the same toy, but just slightly different. Like, just a date stamp and one plastic is a little bit different color. Um, that's where you're like, oh, no, why, why do I have all these? And so when we were talking a little bit here before the show, this is why I'm like, I'm, I'm drawing a line. I'm not going to collect the reissues unless they're significantly different from the original thing that I already own. Because, yeah. like I said, yeah. once you get three, now it's a collection. Now you got to get the whole set, and that's where Jake and I fall into this trap. And I'm I'm urging Jake always to just buy the ones you like, skip the ones you don't like, because I'm a completist. So if I get three of something, it's like, all right, time to hunt down every last, you know, <laughs> Yodobashi camera Japanese exclusive <laughs> battle damaged scanning Bumblebee <laughs> Legends class. Yeah, there was a guy that we recently got a collection of. I won't say his name for privacy reasons, but he had three of three of the same figures, like just three of them of the exact same figure. duplicates, he not different duplicates. versions. Yeah, yeah, and like it was of every single sound wave, possibly under the sun. If it transformed, he had three of them. If it didn't transform, he had at least two of them. It was just like, why do you need to have two or three SDCC exclusive sound waves? I don't know. But the guy bought three of them. And then it's like, why do you need to have four or five um, or three of, you know, just G1 sound waves? I guess you got to have one in tape mode you got to have one in robot mode and i guess you got to have the in-between mode like they do on the packaging back in the day where it's like it's yes. kind of transformed yep it's like there was this guy just went off the walls on sound wave barricade blaster and shockwave so we just got like a huge stupid collection 
of just these four guys and we're like oh my god it's another one it's like dj Khaled, another one another <laughs> one another one it's just like okay now we're on to a different guy another one another one it's like oh my god where are we gonna put I, I gotta be honest i respect his commitment yeah because he went all in he's like i really love all the cassette player characters and the cassettes that's my favorite thing i'm gonna get just that yeah and i mean don't get me wrong one of every sound wave is enough to fill an entire collection like yeah. every sound wave toy thing ever re you know release it's like there are people who collect just optimus prime because there's so many optimus primes and so to a person like that you say you just bought another optimus prime you have optimus prime at home and they're like yeah but this one you see is lighter blue and it has the flame paint on the top of the cab roof and they're like it's not the same yeah that yeah. guy's that guy's sound wave collection if you go into his room it looks like circus city there's just a bunch of sound waves everywhere man <laughs> <laughs> oh my god so let me ask you guys a question man all right so as collectors usually people either collect loose or mint on card now do you guys do loose mint on card or it doesn't matter when it comes to you guys for collecting uh, I'm more of a a package complete kind of guy. Like if I can get it with the package, I'm usually content. I'm usually happier. Um, it, when it comes to masterpiece, now when it comes to your regular run of the mill like Studio Series or just generations in general, I'm like I don't care about the package. I'm just giving the figure. Um, the very select lines I actually care about the packaging. Because I'm just, I just, I don't look at the box. I'm like, I don't care about the box. I want the figure. That's all I give a shit about. That's why I'm here, man. I don't want it in the card. I don't need it. On, I don't need it sealed. That, that me and Ben have had a conversation multiple, multiple times. We buy Transformers because we want to play with them. Ben keeps the package more than I do, but it that's our shtick. We're like, all right, that's why we're buying Transformers so we can take them out and play with them. It's the whole point. You don't want to just sit up there, like it's not like a G.I. Joe where it's just like in a car or like a reaction. It's just like sitting there and it's like, it looks pretty, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am definitely open in play. And I also confess to having filled my mother's garage attic with hundreds of cubic feet of empty transformer packaging. <laughs> I mean, it's. I have the, the empty packaging for almost every figure released in the United States between 1993 and now. <laughs> oh my God. It's a little absurd. But like, here's the thing. I'm so far along with it that I can't bring myself to just go back and throw stuff away. Like with the shop, you know, we were talking about like Energon figures where it's a, it's a kind of little bit older line, but it's not old enough to be super valuable. And so the packaging just makes it take up space, both in the shop and also to ship. You know, if you if you take 10 Energon figures out of their packages and just bag them up with the parts, you can ship that for 10 bucks basically anywhere in the country. But as soon as you're adding in, you know, because they got to package it so it looks big on the shelf. And so packaging is usually like physically large. And all of a sudden it just jacks up the shipping price. And so if it's sealed, like if it's sealed on the card, never been opened, people will be buy that that are the kinds of people that, you know, they want to keep everything sealed in perfect condition like the day it came out of the factory. Um, but for the people that are open and play like Jake and I, most of the time they would rather just get the figure and not have to pay extra shipping to get the package. And so we we do a lot of depackaging of stuff and you know recycle the bubbles, recycle the card backers. If they have like a file card or stats card on the back, we'll clip that off and put it with the toy. But like every time we do that, I always think about, oh, I have this figure's package somewhere in my mother's garage attic, you know, <laughs> and maybe I should do this, but I, I can't bring myself to do it. But then I was vindicated. I was vindicated one time with my package saving ways. Um, there's a figure from Cybertron that is supposed to have these two little uh, fin spoilers that attach to his 
his fender and like he's got these big monster truck wheels in the back and there's like a little fender wing to make him look like a kind of like a stealth jet meta monster truck it's really weird but those wing spoilers they're about you know a, the size of a stamp like a postage stamp and they were packaged in a little plastic bag that is taped to the bottom of the little tray that the figure is in in the box and they're not mentioned in the instructions huh. like the the figure is there you know they have like the blow molded um plastic uh, yep. tray uh -huh. that holds the figure the figure's there he's got his missiles right next to him he's got the the little action key that you plug in to make his missile launchers pop up and yep. then on the back side of the whole cardboard insert thing, there's these two little winglets just taped on there. And I didn't know that this was a thing until, you know, 12 years after I bought this toy back in 2006, a customer of ours from Japan was like, hey, I ordered this figure. You said it was complete, but he doesn't come with these little spoilers. And I'm like, what? What little spoilers? And so he sends us a picture from some other guy's, I think he was another Japanese guy's website of the figure with these little spoilers installed. I'm like, I didn't know he came with those. And so I'm like, but guess what? Joke's on you because I've got mine. So I went up into <laughs> Bob's garage attic and found my big old like moving box full of empty Cybertron packaging and found that character's box. And sure enough, those two little spoilers were still taped to the package. And I was like, hell yeah. See, this is why I saved all this packaging for all these years. Because I still have those spoilers. I almost threw, if I would have thrown packaging away, those would have been long gone. I would have had an incomplete uh, Cybertron dark crumple zone. And you would have never recovered from that. I would have, I'm never going to financially recover from that. Yeah. <laughs> That's wow. That's that's a crazy story. You know, it, it's funny, Ben, because there was a episode of The Simpsons where um, Principal Skinner was su was supposed to show up in court for Bart. Bart was in court, and I guess what ended up happening was he was inside his mother's garage, and he had all these newspapers that he collected throughout the years, and all the papers fell on him, so he was just like stuck, so he couldn't make it to the court. So, like, I'm just picturing, like, Jake, like, he's just at work, like, hey, wait a minute. Where's Ben? And all you hear is, like, help! <laughs> all these transformer boxes. <laughs> trapped under boxes. <laughs> just trapped we, under <laughs> we have a word for that. It's called a crapalanche. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. So, let me ask you this. So, what's your favorite generations for Transformers to collect? Is it G1s? beast wars like what's the what's the your favorite line to collect or is it just everything transformers uh well having something like 5000 transformer sets i obviously collect everything transformers um my favorite lines within transformers are you know g1 g1 holds a special place for every transformers collector cuz that's where it started but here's the thing. I was born in 1986, you know, when Transformers was at its peak. I was actually born on the day that the Transformers animated movie debuted in theaters. Oh, so wow. I was too late for most of that stuff. And there's only like 10, 12 G1 Transformers that I got brand new. Like there was still some things, you know, like they had like the MicroMaster sets were hanging around the local Ben Franklin until 1992. You know, things like that. Or, you know, my parents found some dead stock in a little mom and pop shop one time and I got them for Christmas in 1995. But I didn't really grow up with G1 except for secondhand stuff that I got at garage sales. So I grew up with Generation 2, which ran from 1993 to 1995. And that was, you know, basically... It was Hasbro being like, all right, if we can make a little more money off of these these guys that we already have by coloring them, you know, neon and put a missile launcher with it, good enough. But, you know, the, the nostalgia factor with those is strong for me because they're, you know, those are the ones that I remember getting at my birthday party. Those are the ones that were under the tree on Christmas Day. Um, 
So my, my, my nostalgia for Generation 2 is very strong. That's one of my kind of my prized possession lines. Um, I still have all of them that I, you know, received as a kid. Those are have all been with me since 1993 or four or five. Um, one of my favorite lines to collect that I did just because I'm a grown up now and I have money and I can <laughs> um, was the Japanese version of Transformers Prime. Um, it, they called it Arms Micron there, and the the difference was their figures um the japanese culture is more into like hobby model building mm. you know like gu gundam models and yep. just plastic vehicle models you know that's why a lot of the model cars and paints and stuff are all tamiya which is a japanese brand um so they wanted to incorporate that into transformers and so they included you get a sprue from the factory with um, the Micron figure on it, which you cut it, you cut it off the sprue, you put the stickers on the, the little figure and the main figure, and you basically build a little, you know, tiny transformer that turns into the main figure's weapon. And then oh, they wow. give you different stickers and you can kind of customize it. Um, and then the, the, the other gimmick that they get you with is you're supposed to collect the little guys and you can build them into bigger weapons to like customize further. Um, and then they had, you know, all these exclusives. And if you go to this store on a certain day, you get that figure, but he's like in black or like clear red, you know, the sparkly colors and stuff compared to what you get from the regular release. And um, it was one of those dangerous paths where uh, I got one of the figures and enjoyed building the little the little microns and turning them into the weapons and stuff. And then I bought a couple more and then fast forward a year and a half and I have every last one under the sun. And it was it was enjoyable. I always enjoyed it. Um, you know, I'd get piles of these little sprue figures and my wife and I would sit here and, you know, neatly cut them apart and put them together so they looked, you know, nice and polished and finished. Um, so that that's one of my modern favorites of Transformers lines that I collected. Oh, that's awesome. Wait, are those the little figures, Ben, that um, they kind of like attach to each other? Like they're tiny, they almost look like Legos, but not really, but you can like connect each one? What you just said describes like four or five things that I can think of, but it's similar. Okay. Um, they're, they're a little more like they're, they're clearly a, a, a weapon or a robot. Um, on their own like they don't just look like a building toy it's just that they use a system of five millimeter pegs and sockets where you can build you know you can like take optimus prime's gun and put like a long uh spear part on the barrel to make it look like a sniper rifle you know stuff like that where you can kind of combine them once you know once you have multiples um but they're 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 commonly called mini cons in the U.S. Okay. Um, but like I said, there's a there's a bunch of little figures like that where you can build them together like Lego. But that's yeah, I, I guess that's a similar one. Oh, all right, all right, awesome. Uh, what about you, Jake? What about for you? Like, are you like just G1, or are you just like a little bit or everything? Just like Ben, or is this like I know you you said you talked about masterpieces. Yeah, my my whole shtick from. I've come to terms with was I I grew up with the movies that was that was my G1 for me and I just loved everything about them and I recognize now as an adult that they are terrible but I still <laughs> love them to death because that's what I grew up with so now that I am an adult I'm like okay I want all the movie figures but then Ben was like, no, don't do that. That's a decade or more worth of shit that you probably will be lukewarm. <laughs> about. Can, I, can I throw something in here? Yeah, of course. Prior to the 2007 movie coming out, there were something like n close to a thousand different unique Transformers toys released. So that's going from 1984 when it started to 2007, just before the movies came out, right? So that's... that's uh, 13 years, no, no, 23 years. Mm -hmm. And you have 
a thousand different figures to collect. From 2007 to now, post the movies coming out, we've now had six films, you know, US versions, Japanese versions. Now there's something like 12,000 Transformers to collect. Wow. And the movies are a big chunk of that. So that's that was my argument to Jake. So I was like, no way, there's too many. Don't do it. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. 12,000. So, so what my 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 next thing was, okay, well, I have studio series and I bought mainly all of them. And then I was super pissed by just the the influx of bullshit bumblebee repaints and just random crap that didn't need to exist in the line and just it being an influx of basically just lukewarm shit at best and i'm just like i just don't care about this this is my third bumblebee why do i have another bumblebee it's the same one this one's just gold with dino tapes and it sucks and i hate it so the, the 13th bumblebee was no better yeah exactly so i'm like all right i i i'm gonna collect masterpiece and that's just going to be strictly my thing. And that didn't last for very long. But one of my favorite lines that I do did love to really get into um, was Siege. Siege was just uh, such a nice breath of fresh air of getting the same G1 characters, which I guess a lot of people are kind of tired of now for like having the 15th time. <laughs> Um, but like it was just such a great awesome line and we didn't really have any qc issues thankfully we heard about it but like everything that i got from that whole line was just awesome it was just so intuitive the engineering was there the price was pretty good the painting was really well it's just all of it was awesome and i just loved every single bit of that so that was one of my, and it's just like of, out of everything that I've seen at the shop, this brand new toy line for generations is the one that makes me go, wow, I really, really just loved this line. It was just too awesome to exist. It's almost like having fun toys is a good thing. Yeah. That's awesome. Wow. That's awesome. I, I didn't even know any of that. So that's awesome. So let me ask you this. You guys, since you guys are diehard Transformer fans, Obviously, you guys know that Netflix did that show, uh, The Toys That Made Us, and uh, they featured uh, Power Rangers, uh, TNMT, Star Wars, and they had a Transformers segment in it. And me, as a person who's a layman who doesn't know too much about Transformers, you know, I found it very informative um, for myself since I don't know so much. I'm trying to learn more about Transformers, but... As two guys that know a lot about Transformers, how do you feel that Netflix special was? They were pretty factual. Um, I think that I don't recall having any major objections in terms of, you know, something that they got completely wrong. Like, you know, oh, Optimus Prime came out in 1985. Um, actually, he came out in 1984. I, I didn't really <laughs> run into any of that. Um, however, they did use one of my images in that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, there's the line that came before Transformers is one of the lines that came before is called Diaclone. And that's where a lot of the, like the cars and jets come from. Um, if you've ever seen a lot of the G1 figures from 1984 and five, a lot of them have like an opening cockpit that you can seat a little like inch tall driver in. Right. And uh, so recently Diaclone has kind of come back into the vogue because People are like, oh, well, you know, I collected all the G1 Transformers. I don't really want anything newer than the 1980s. Um, but I still, you know, I still got to get that fixed. And so they're looking to this old, you know, fairly obscure Japanese toy line. Um, and so the prices have, you know, just gone through the roof uh, for anything from this Diaclone line that's related to Transformers. And also they're making new Diaclone toys, which are super excellent. And I have to rant to you about some other time. Um, but I got way into this stuff. I don't own any of the original toys because they're crazy expensive. I mean, there are toys from that series that are worth probably tens of thousands of dollars in nice enough condition. Um, oh. But I got into the lore 
and uh, I got into a project of um, getting scans of the toy catalogs, which were these multi-page booklets, and they had like, you know, nice stock photography and original artwork and stuff. And it just gave some history to this, which I didn't know much about previously. I knew it existed and I knew what some of the toys looked like, but I didn't know like, you know, what the, the, what it was like to actually grow up playing with that in Japan in 1982. Um, and through the magic of computers and learning to uh, hunt and peck Japanese characters into a keyboard and then plop them into Google Translate and, you know, Japanese translation dictionaries. Um, I did a project on uh, Transformerland blog where I translated all those catalogs. And um, some people generously donated scans of some of the catalogs and some of them we had in house, you know, because we do occasionally get, you know, really rare stuff like that in. Um, but they talk about the diaclone in the toys that made us with respect to what I just told you, you know, that it's kind of the, the, the predecessor of Transformers. Um, and they show on the screen a picture of Diaclone toys from one of the catalogs. And there's like a crease mark in the shape of a V at the top of the page on this picture. And it's the exact same crease mark that's on the one in my, my catalog <laughs> scan section. So like, wow. I want credit for that. <laughs> wow. So so your catalog is on the toys that made us. <laughs> yes. Wow. That one actually was um, generously donated. Uh, the scan of it was contributed to us by by one of the friends of our site who's credited in the article. And I'd, I'd honestly have to check which catalog that was from to tell you the name of the guy. But um, yeah, if you if you ever want to know more than most people want to know about the history of Diaclone, uh, definitely go to our blog section. You can see all that stuff. Um, uh, we're we're going to have to do another podcast on that. <laughs> That's going to be sure. a special podcast on that. And like I said, the, the new toy line, uh, people are calling it Diaclone Reboot, um, but it's actually just called Diaclone again. Uh, they're all new toys and they are fantastic. And we'll have to do a segment on that at some point because I cannot shut up about those things. It made me almost <laughs> stop collecting Transformers. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, if Diaclone almost made Jake stop collecting Transformers, then yes, that means that we have to do another podcast on that. <laughs> so yeah, those, um, those figures are phenomenal, but yeah, they are they're crazy, crazy with engineering, which makes me think like, okay, you're spending all this money, all this time, all these engineers to make these amazing, awesome figures that don't snap in your hands as you're trying to transform it, <clears throat> a masterpiece. <clears throat> so like, what the hell is happening with Takara in general with their masterpiece line slash other things? It's like, okay, so you got Diaclone Perfect, why the hell can't you get Masterpiece? Your giant, clearly <laughs> more people like this line yeah. and want to go to it more than Diaclone. So why the hell can't you guys just get that one right? <laughs> and the cutesies on this stuff. So that's what pisses me off. And what makes me want to go, okay, fine. If you if you, you just are slacking on your MP stuff, I'll just go collect your Diaclone because clearly you care about that part. <laughs> Meanwhile, somewhere there's a Takara Tomy executive going, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Tell me how you feel about my one toy line by not buying it and instead giving me money for my other toy line. <laughs> That'll fix my wagon. <laughs> hey, um, there was a Transformer that was featured on the Toys That Made Us, and it was a VHS. And I'm like, wait a minute. I've never seen this VHS Transformer. I mean, I know about Reflector um, and a couple other Transformers that look like regular household objects or regular objects that we buy, but I've never seen a VHS one, and they, they showed it. And I looked all over the Internet for that. I couldn't find anything. Um, did you guys know anything about that? I'm honestly not aware of it. Um, I it's been a couple of years since I've seen that episode. That was one of the first season episodes, right? Yes. But um, I I don't know of anything. There were so in in one of the other pre Transformers lines was called Microchange, 
And the whole gimmick of micro change was there was like robots that disguised themselves as everyday objects and it would help, you know, the Japanese boy fight the evil invaders coming from space when they showed up in his bedroom at 10 o'clock at night, you know. And that's where you get like Soundwave, Blaster, um, all the, the, the mini cassette guys. Um, Megatron uh, was one of four different gun robos. Um, and there were some canceled ones. There was like a, like a big camping flashlight guy. Um, and then there was a couple others that were not turned into Transformers, but maybe should have been. Uh, there was a guy that turned into a pair of binoculars and he was released as microchange, but he never got to decide whether to be an Autobot or a Decepticon. Um, Perceptor is another one that came from that line. Um, so I, I know that the, the flashlight one was concept stages only, um, but I, I guess I don't know of any VHS ones. I mean, besides, Betamax was better, so. My God, maybe we found <laughs> toys was, the toys uh, that made us was wrong about. Maybe we found it. Yeah. Like, you're uh, not real Transformer fans. You put this VHS knockoff <laughs> in this Transformers episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I was just asking you guys that question because I just recently rewatched that episode about, like, two months ago, and I'm like, wait a minute, like, I've never seen this VHS Transformer before, and I found it weird, and I couldn't find anything about it online, so it was just interesting, man, because I really love those, like, household common, like, sound wave or, like, a, a flashlight that turns into a Transformer. I really find those, like, pretty cool, so... And Actually, I, I got a question. I, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking about this. This VHS Transformer, was it, like, a... a cassette recorder or was it a camcorder for vhs it was a cassette a vhs okay. cassette yeah. oh, oh no 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 no! i know what you're talking about now that was not a vhs cassette so the the mini cassettes that everybody in transformers knows like frenzy rumble laser beak buzzsaw yep. all those guys those are actually modeled after a type of cassette called a micro cassette um, and they were commonly used in like the 80s and 90s in things like um, like little pocket things where you can record voice memos for yourself. Oh. Um, I remember my grandma's uh, answering machine used that type of cassette. You know, back when the, there's probably maybe some younger people that are going to be in the audience, but before digital voicemail, we had answering machines. And you had to sit there and wait while the cassette rewinded so that you could leave your message recorded on a cassette to be played back later. So those guys are micro cassettes and they're actually the, the correct size for a micro cassette. Um, but in the, the Transformers television show, they always portrayed them as being like a standard music cassette, right? Like they'd always show like, oh, this, this worker picks up Soundwave and doesn't know that he's, you know, an evil robot and he's like carrying him on his shoulder and listening to some generic rock music at the work site or whatever. But the, the truth of the matter is that is not the type of cassette that Soundwave and his cassettes portray. However, in MicroChange, again, going back to this pre-Transformers line, they had full-size cassette toys. And these are the size of an actual music cassette like you'd make your hot mixtape on in 1994, right? <laughs> and... They have like, you know, they have the little trapezoid part at the bottom where it's wider, where the tape is exposed. Yep. They have that. And there were two of them. One of them transforms into a motorcycle and the other one transforms into a helicopter. And the motorcycle one, the wheels of the motorcycle and end up kind of where the spool is. And so it gives the impression of a very big spool. Whereas, you know, when you look at like a music cassette from the 80s or 90s, you only really see that little tiny window in the middle where it kind of shows you how much tape is played and how much is yet right. to be played. So they're, they're not VHS as they're full size cassettes. I think that's what you're talking about. Yes. Yes. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. Because I, I didn't know, like I saw it, I'm like, what is that man? But I'm glad that you explained that to me, Ben, because I just wasn't sure what that was, but now I know I'm glad that I'm talking to the right guys about this. Um, 
Have you guys ever heard, you or Jake, of Mattel's Computer Warriors? Yes, I have. Uh, the little, little tiny, like, two-inch action figures that look like they're made out of diodes and resistors and shit. Yeah, yeah. So, um... I guess Mattel put out these things called Computer Warriors um, back in 88, 89, and there was one that looked like a Pepsi can, yeah. and when you opened it, it was like a little like like station. Uh, there was one that was a full-size desktop computer, and that's like the most expensive one, but yeah, uh, it was funny because I'm like, wow, so we had Transformers. And then everybody was getting into the Transformers craze because um, I just found out about Computer Warriors. I had no idea what Computer Warriors was until I did my research. But, yeah, there was a Pepsi can. There was a flashlight. Uh, like I said before, a PC computer desktop. Have you guys ever run into that um, at the store or know people that collect that? Yes, we actually have some stashed away. Um, so my wife and I do also non-Transformers toys through Transformer Land. Um, we do lots of Masters of the Universe, Ninja Turtles, G.I. Joe, like vintage Star Wars from the original trilogy. Um, and we bought a collection from a gentleman who had, he was some kind of a hotshot banker, a stock market accountant or something in the 80s. Like he was a grown man in the 80s and decided it was cool to collect action figures before collecting action figures was cool for grownups to do. Um, you know, I, I know I got a lot of shit through like middle and high school that I still played with toys, but those guys don't know what's going on. Um, and this guy would, it looked to me like he'd just go to Toys R Us and just sweep stuff off of the shelf into his cart, take it home, put it in a box. And, uh, he has some computer warrior stuff in there that we just haven't got to yet. But I, I know we've got some of those items. I think there was also one where it's just like a little circuit board couple inches across and you just put a dude on top of it and he flies it around which is kind of hilarious but i and i think computer warriors also got the benefit because you said they were released in 88 or 89 um, yep. that was like micro machines era everything in the late 80s had to be micro like that was the cool thing to do you know transformers had the micro masters where they're you know you get a four pack of little tiny transformers instead of one big one um, you had micro machines and a million knockoffs of that and everything was micro. And so I think that's, that's part of where those computer warriors were like, well, kids like stuff that turns into other stuff, but they also like micro stuff. So we'll make micro little guys that ride inside of stuff that turns into other stuff. And it's, it's a pretty interesting concept and I'm a little surprised it didn't take off. But the 80s were such fertile ground for just cool toy ideas. I think that just, you know, not everything could get the, the oxygen to really take off and become successful. Like, you know, the big lines, Transformers, G.I. Joe, Masters Universe, Ninja Turtles, you know, the ones that have stuck around for 30 years without without pause. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy, man. Because in the late '80s, um, going into the '90s, like you said, like you said, Ben, you had like a lot of those little micro toys, and you had like Mighty Max, um, Polly Pocket, was yeah. for the girls. Um, you had a lot of those in the '90s, but yeah, it's funny. There was that little, that little mini micro craze in the '80s and '90s, man. Like the '90s was a was a really funny period of time. And Jake, uh, you know, you're you're a movie buff, and what I remember from the uh, from the 90s is that for some reason because it was the hip thing back in the 90s every time you watch like a movie back then even if it was like for kids or adults like at the end of the credit scene there's always a rap song and the rap tells you what the whole movie was about so like you know like you had ninja turtles the first movie and you had like that partners in crime turtle power song uh, and he's like, yeah, Michelangelo, he's the leader of the crew. And he's like telling the whole story. And like, it's same thing with Ghostbusters too, man. Like the nineties was like a oh. funny period, man. Like they had yeah. to, exp they had to explain the whole movie to you, like in a rap song. <laughs> yeah. I'm surprised that like, cause you see everybody did it. Like Ghostbusters did it. Yeah. Like almost all the Turtles movies in the 90s did it. Just like, <laughs> yeah. here you go. Here's your rap song. I'm surprised Aliens 
didn't have a rap song in it. Or Jurassic like, Park. Yeah, Jurassic Park. They're like, yeah, Don, I'm going to come and eat your ass. Jurassic <laughs> Park. It's just like, I, I guess it's just like some corporate crony sitting in his office like, hey, what the kids like? The kids like uh, that new hip-hop music. Yeah, put that in everything. <laughs> <laughs> I know there's there's some pretty hilarious. You know, I said I collect Generation Two because that's what I, you know, grew up with. Generation Two was the beginning of yes. like <laughs> neon colors, computer animation, like really crude. Computer oh, animation. that and play, that PlayStation One cutscene animation. Yes, '90s <laughs> rap though. They had a bunch of Generation Two television commercials for the toys. That were rap songs, and they were terrible. <laughs> They're also simultaneously the best thing to ever come out of Transformers. <laughs> the best worst thing you've ever heard. Yeah, it's like <laughs> what big battle in Dunicus for Bruticus. Yeah. <laughs> you just you just you just walk into a record store. Excuse me, sir. You have that new hip hop tape or with Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg, you know, the Transformers one? <laughs> They're like, yes, of course we do. Here's your, yes, here, we have the G2 soundtrack. There you go. <laughs> it's got all the rap songs. Combaticons are soaring. Onslaught is roaring. <laughs> oh, and now they combine into Bruticus, and he's a big, bad battle in Duticus. My rhythm is no worse than the commercials. Fight me. <laughs> <laughs> so some music executive is standing outside your window right now. It's like, hey, who's that cool guy doing that hip hop track? Let's go sign him right now. I get. I guess oh. you guys aren't ready for this yet. <laughs> it's like, bro, you need to become a professional rap artist. Hey, uh, Judicus is already trademarked. Dude, can't do it for you. <laughs> hey, Jake, uh, I want to ask you a, a question, man. Um. What did you think of the Bumblebee movie? Because uh, and even you too, Ben, because I felt like the Bumblebee movie, uh, just the character designs for the Transformers, like they look like the original G1 characters better than the Michael Bay films. And like, how did you feel about the Bumblebee movie as, as opposed to the Michael Bay? Yeah, my whole thing was, well, clearly Travis Knight, when he was like, in, in every interview, he was like, I was a kid of the 80s and I grew up with G1 and that was my whole thing and that's what I wanted to make. And clearly that's what everybody else wanted when the Transformers movie was first announced. And they were all like, oh my God, we're going to get just, you know, we've all seen the old CG YouTube videos of like real life Transformers in huge quotations. Yeah, everybody's speculation of what yeah, it's going to look like. Exactly, and then Michael Bay comes out with this, like, you know, legs for days, weird boomer flame, giant titty window, Optimus Prime, <laughs> and he looks fucking weird. And everybody's <laughs> like, this is not what I wanted. So when we all got Bumblebee, you know, a decade later, it's a huge breath of fresh air. But at the same time, for me, I... I love the movie. I, I think it's really good. I mean, it's got, it takes a bunch of cues from a bunch of different movies, like Iron Giant, um, uh, just a bunch of different stuff. And it, it was good and I really enjoyed it. And I thought that all the CG models were really awesome, but my nostalgia hit more for the old Bayformer looks. And I was like, I love this. It, this is brilliant but I like this and it was just it just it, it just hit so much more for me where I wanted to go watch the old Bay movies and even though they're terrible I was like Bumblebee is of course a more way more competent movie and it actually tries to tell a story in a cohesive manner I just thought like okay yeah I prefer the Bay movie aesthetic comparatively and I know I'm gonna get hate for that that's just what shit is. The but, YouTube uh, comments are gonna go. We're gonna get a bunch of YouTube comments over this. <laughs> hey, that's a good way to get your show started, though. Is all that YouTube comment attention? Yeah, exactly. I know. The algorithm loves that kind of conflict. Exactly. Uh, so, but yeah, like that. The movie was the movie was good. It had some parts here and there. Where now that I've rewatched it, you know, twenty three hundred times, I'm like, okay, there's some stuff here and there. Few 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 things that I can pick out. Not as bad as the Bay movies, but uh, I don't know. I think that there, it's a good, competent movie. And when it first came out, I was like, holy shit, this is the beginning of a new thing. And of course, nothing's happened. 
for the new movies that's following that <laughs> my <laughs> my theory is that people were so burned out by the fifth Bayverse movie that they weren't willing to give it another shot because they automatically assumed that it was more of the same um but my my two cents is bumblebee was actually good uh if you haven't watched it go watch it um and i do like the aesthetic of the characters there's a lot more like it's easier to wrap your head around what parts of the airplane, you know, make up Blitzwing's chest. You know what I mean? Like Starscream turns into a fighter jet from the the 2007 movie and Blitzwing turns into a fighter jet, you know, from the 80s. Um, but one of those, I can tell where the engine intakes are. I can tell where the cockpit bubble is. I can tell where the wings go, where a Starscream turns into this weird Dorito robot with big ape arms that have missiles for wings. <laughs> yeah. You know, and some of the stuff from the movies was, if we were talking about, you know, film critique, I would call it experimental. Yeah. Some of the, like, the character designs. Um Today, I've had, for probably the fifth time, somebody describe the Bavers Decepticons especially as looking like they're crab people. Like, actual <laughs> crab crabs. Crab people. <laughs> and, yeah, that's, that's kind of true. They had some interesting concepts, but I guess I do, I do kind of go for a little bit more traditional uh, layout with the Bumblebee movie stuff. You know, there's the, the panels are a little bit smoother. You know, there's a little bit less just random details where you're not sure where that goes on the car. Yeah. Um, and honestly, that makes toys easier to make. Yeah. If you have clearly the car is on the robot, it's easier to turn that into reality with a toy. Yeah. Um, and frankly, the, the Masterpiece movie figures have struggled with that. Like, there's, there's a lot of engineering... Um, it's a word I'm looking for, compromises that have to be made in order to make a, a vehicle look like the vehicle, but also like the character model from the films. It's very hard to do when things just kind of, the character models don't have to use all the vehicle parts. So now you got to hide them all. Yeah. Um, and honestly, the other thing that's most guilty of that is the G1 animation, you know? The yep. animators didn't bother drawing every last wheel on Optimus Prime's leg. And so now if you want it to be perfectly animation accurate, you've got to figure out a way to get the wheels inside of his leg without anybody being able to tell that they were there. So, Yeah, that is so true, man. It's funny, man. Thinking about, like, animators and animation, like, so I would watch, like, the old uh, Transformers cartoons. And not just Transformers, but, like, even Thundercats, uh, Turtles, Silverhawks, like... A lot of the animation was sent out overseas, and there'll there'll be times where I'm looking at Optimus Prime, but it's Megatron's voice. Or then, like, I'm looking at Optimus Prime, and he's red, and then all of a sudden his chest is like purple. <laughs> so yeah, uh, the G1 cartoon, as much as some people will never admit it, the G1 cartoon was rife with animation errors. I think there were something like four or five different animation studios that worked on it. Yeah. Um, some of them were more error prone than others. Mainly the Koreans. One. Yeah, the Koreans Acom yeah. Was, was one of them where it's just like, there's they put a guy that clearly died in the movie is just standing around in the scene because they didn't bother to do their homework. Which episode? I, I, can't, I can't ever remember the episode. It's it's an Acom animated episode. It's the one where they're fighting the Constructicons and they kill Optimus, quote unquote. He's not really dead. And then uh, they turn his body into an alligator that hangs out in the sewers. Oh, is that an Acom? <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, a city of steel. It looks like shit. So yes, it, it's a comes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that episode's awesome. They chop up Optimus and turn him into an alligator and, and put his arm on the top of the Empire State Building with his gun. <laughs> They're like, oh, he died. He's just gray now. He's just dead. Your robot dad's dead. Yeah. Then, then you got to deal with the the scarring of your robot dad coming back as a horrifying zombie that's and awesome. dying again. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that one I knew. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, the, the I gotta I gotta look up that. The 80s episode. are are charming, but they're not always consistent. Yeah. <laughs> All yeah. right, here, here's the. Have been um actually rewatching 
all the Transformers series as much as we can. We watched a little bit of G1, went, holy shit, this is this is getting really bad. And then we were like, <laughs> all right, we're going to turn that off for a little while and put on some other good shows. And then we finished those and then put on He-Man. That is a cheap show. They rightfully admit that on the commentaries and interviews. And they're like, yes, it's cheap. But it's not anima- animation error ridden. And it actually is a very wholesome show. Well, so that's... we're like, wow, this is crazy to see just like the two going at each other. And then He-Man's got its cheapness to it but it's also like okay we have a life lesson we have what you need to know in in life as a kid and then you got transformers over here being like i don't want to walk around the fucking street you idiot what do you want from me today here's your lesson don't get your arm attached to the empire state building (laughs) it's so funny in the 80s we always had those like lessons for kids man like remember kids don't do drugs all right we're out of here and it's like he man like on top of like his uh what's the name of the 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 lion that he rode um battle cat yeah oh my god like the 80s was filled with those psa's at the end especially gi joe man so that's another that's another rabbit hole to get into but here's a big question for both of you as transformers fans and i'm gonna ask jake the question first and i think i know the answer Jake, GoBots yeah. or Transformers? Wait, which one is it? GoBots or Transformers? Which oh, one's gosh. better? Uh, it's going to go Transformers, but GoBots, the more and more I played with the original toy line because of Ben and then the, um, the, the follow-up line the, by Action Toys, GoBots is really good like really really good like those things it's crazy to see that those if those had a really good show i'm pretty sure they would have kicked transformers ass because just some of them are so so solid and they're just way better like put together than some of the other transformers so but for me personally it's gonna go transformer I have trained my apprentice <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm a big GoBots fan. Um, big, big GoBots fan. Uh, I One of the most expensive, or one of the most amounts of money I've spent to get a toy, and it's a complicated story, but the most amounts of money I've spent to get a toy was for the last GoBot that I needed for my collection. Um, and as Jake said, They had a cartoon that was way out of its depth. It was Hanna-Barbera. It looked like something out of the 60s. And it just did not play well in the 80s when you had more competent animation coming out of studios. And, you know, like you said, a lot of that stuff was sent abroad. Japan, Korea, uh, the Philippines, I know, operated a bunch of animation studios. And they were able to turn out a better looking show. And... um, you know, it all boiled down to writing teams, too, and decisions that were made. But uh, the GoBots toy line was of a very high quality. And it is my personal belief that GoBots is what made Transformers good. And the let me walk you through the timeline. Okay. 1983 was when Tonka secured the license from uh, Bandai Toys in Japan to release their machine robo in the United States as GoBots. And it's it's a very much a mirror of the story between Diaclone, which we talked about, and Transformers, was machine robo and GoBots. So in 83, they hit the store shelves here with GoBots. Um, and you had your regular GoBots, which were about four inch scale in robot mode. Um, They were fairly inexpensive, um, you know, like three, four dollars per figure. And then you had your super robots, which were maybe like six inch scale, and they were about ten dollars new. And then in 1984, Hasbro secured the license to bring Takara's Diaclone and Microchange to the United States as Transformers, right? But that was when GoBots was hitting the peak of its marketing cycle. You know, they were like, okay, now we've got like 30, 40 different toys to pick from. We've got um, some specially made bases that were designed by Tonka just for the U.S. You know, they had the 
the one that looks totally like an at at i'm sure you've seen it oh yeah um, yeah yep and it's like we've got bases they've got electronics we've got the little ones we've got the big ones we've got some that combine we've got like power suits where you can fit the little guys in a in like a, a body armor and then combine those together to make a big guy um they had motorized stuff i mean they they really did innovate with that line and then transformer shows up with you know some recycled japanese toys and a really good cartoon and so transformers takes off because of the cartoon that was the biggest toy commercial for a toy that you could ever hope to have was a 22 minute long cartoon <laughs> yeah. um and so GoBots is like, oh, shit, we should get a cartoon, too. And they partnered with Hanna-Barbera because that was kind of like it was like picking teams for dodgeball in school. And it's like, uh, sure, Hanna-Barbera, we'll go with you guys. And the GoBots cartoon just didn't cut the mustard. It was it was cheesy and corny and campy and dated. Um, you know, obviously all 80s cartoons were campy to some extent, Transformers included. I mean, they chopped up Optimus and turned him into an alligator and put his arm on the Empire State Building. <laughs> but like, GoBots just came out of the gate too late. And this is all 80s toy lines that were super successful had a cartoon. He-Man was the first one where it's like, wait, we can just have a cartoon about our toy and just use that to sell the toy for free? Yes. Uh, G.I. Joe came out with their cartoon in 1983, and obviously, you know, G.I. Joe is super collectible from the 80s, and GoBots just hit the whole cartoon thing as a toy commercial too late, didn't get a good cartoon out there, but despite that, and despite popular belief, GoBots persisted through 1986 when the Transformers the movie was in theaters, there were still new GoBots hitting toy shelves. Mm -hmm. And 1987, there were like a couple figures, and there was the tail end of the Rock Lords toy line, which is cooler than you think. Um, but GoBots through that whole time, they all had die-cast metal parts, they all had rubber tires, they all had like lots of chrome, and Transformers in 1986, immediately, like halfway through the year, they, they stopped having rubber tires on figures. So like if you got an Ultra Magnus in uh, February of 1986, he would have rubber tires, chrome smokestacks, chrome front bumper, you know, <laughs> paint details on his face, and, you know, a clear plastic windshield. But if you waited and got your Ultra Magnus in December of 86, he had plastic wheels, very little chrome, no paint on his face. His face was like the inner robot just had a white head. It was just white. And then you put on the, like the helmet for his super mode and it was just a blue helmet. There was no, no paint detail, no nothing. And then a lot of um, like Gen X traditional G1 collectors, you know, guys, you've, older than us that were into this stuff when they were kids they're like that's when it lost my interest was 87 and all of a sudden the figures didn't feel like they were you know there was no die cast there was no chrome there was less paint you know they still made some cool designs i like a lot of stuff from that era but a lot of people are like yeah they kind of started phoning it in and they didn't go the extra mile with rubber tires and stuff like that and i'm like gee that coincides pretty nicely with Transformers really the only competitor disappearing from store shelves. It's almost like competition from GoBots forced Transformers to bring their A game. Wow. Wow. I didn't even, wow. I, I had no idea uh, about this whole information you just told me, Ben. That's, that's awesome. And for the people listening right now, like that's great information, man, because again, like I'm just learning about Transformers and, trying to get my knowledge based up and like all the stuff that you and Jake said today just blew my mind. It's a lot of things that I didn't know. And hopefully the people that are listening to this, they're going to gain a lot of knowledge too. But we are almost at the, well, we are at the one hour and 23 minute mark of the podcast. But before we leave, and I'm going to ask you guys both this question now just to get some advice. So Jake, if you were to give 
one of the listeners here listening advice on, you know, if they're going to start collecting Transformers, what advice would you give them? Honestly, collect what you like. Collect easy, cool, good stuff. Because that's the only thing that you can do. If you go for the hard hitting, just like, I'm going to collect all of G1, you're immediately going to be dissatisfied because you spent, you know, $50, $70 on a hot rod or whatever that you're just like, I hate this thing and it's not very good or whatever. Or just you didn't spend $165 on a non-broken prowl and so you spent the $70 on a broken prowl and now you're angry. So it's just like collect what you want, collect what you think is the best representation of what you're wanting aesthetically because that's all that matters at the end of the day all that matters is what you care about not what your buddy down the street gives a shit about all that matters awesome what about you ben uh start small and honestly um if you have 80s toys now's a better time to sell them than it is to buy them because prices on 80s stuff are through the roof if you've got an attic full of 80s toys somewhere um definitely look us up we're we're always buying but the there's there's a lot of money in 80s stuff right now and there's a lot of really enjoyable stuff that's a lot newer than the 80s um but if you're hardcore into the 80s uh you know, other than what Jake said about collecting what you like, I would say go for quality if you can. Um, because, you know, 80s stuff, I think, is is a pretty good uh, investment. You know, um, we talked a little bit before the show about, you know, how long is the 80s craze going to go on? And I think it's going to stay around for, you know, probably 20, 30 years you know, when the, the kids that were born in the 70s and grew up in the 80s and, you know, love these toys and cartoons and all the, the media from that era. Um, as long as those people are around, these 80s toys are going to hold value. And with toys from, you know, the 80s, what we, we call vintage. I mean, technically vintage is whatever you want it to mean. But, you know, original toy lines for each of these series. Um, condition is everything. So if you're going to spend a bunch of money on an 80s toy, I would say get a really nice one that way. If you change your mind later, you're not out anything. You know, you can probably sell it for, you know, exactly what it's worth. It's going to hold its value. Um, But I guess, yeah, collect what you like and start out small and make sure you like something before jumping in, you know, head first. Nice, nice. And where and where can the audience like find you guys? Like, if they want to order stuff, can you guys uh, let everybody know how to reach you guys? And if you know, like, what's the website? So all of our buying and selling happens through transformerland.com. Uh, no S in the middle. Um, I'm assuming you can post a link in the the description. Yeah. Uh, but transformerland.com. Um, when you get to the site. We've got contact information for selling us collections if you're looking to unload some stuff and get some cash. Um, And then there's also a button for store. You can search our store for basically any any of the toys we've talked about. Um, We've also got our toy guides in Wiki, which is where you go if you want to learn about the figures, uh, read my ramblings in a textual form and and find out all these historical tidbits. Um, We also have photos for collector's guides of everything so that whenever you're buying a a figure or even selling a figure, you can see exactly what it came with. You can find out what it should look like if it's a genuine copy Um, and just tons of information there. And all our contact information is is easy to get to. So transformerland.com. And hopefully we have enough there for you to spend all day every day if you want to during the quarantine browsing our site. That's awesome. But before we take off, uh, you guys can just, I'm going to stop the show, but I want you guys to stay on the line with me. Um, So I just want to tell the audience that this was an introduction to Ben and Jake from Transformerland.com. And I want to tell you guys that these guys are going to be regulars on the show. 
because we have a lot of things uh, coming up. And I know one of the episodes I want to get into mask. Uh, that is a line that I'm collecting for right now. And I know that you guys have a lot of knowledge in that. So I want to get into mask. I want to talk more about Diaclone. And we're going to have some special guests on also here. Uh, but yeah, man, I want to let the audience know that this was the first episode of the Toy Owl segment. And this was an introduction to Ben and Jake. And... We're going to have a lot more episodes coming up with these guys. So I hope you guys liked it and check out transformerland.com. And I'm Steve Garcia, and I'm signing off with uh, Ben and Jake from transformerland.com. Thank you for listening, guys.